Howdy. So I'm Mark. And I'm Ben. And this is Yurt, Your Environmental Road Trip, an environmental documentary that's not depressing. We explored sustainable solutions in all 50 states in one year, the good, the bad, and the weird. And we found plenty of all three. Let's start with some good news first, like the notion that we can power our entire country with clean energy three times over by paving our roads with solar panels. There's 25,000 square miles of road surfaces, parking lots, and driveways in the lower 48 states. If we covered that with solar panels, just a 15% efficiency, we produce three times more electricity than this country uses on an annual basis. And that's almost enough to power the entire world. Roads are collecting heat anyways, this thing collects the power and stores it. Your whole road is an electric grid that delivers the power right to your front door, along with cable TV, high-speed internet access, your telephone, everything right there. The technology behind it has already been done to death. I'm just taking a lot of different technologies, making something new out of it. We're going to get rid of coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants. This thing's cost a billion dollars a piece to build. All of that money can be rolled back into the solar roadway system. It's time to move on, put fossil fuels behind us, and move into the 21st century. Let's fix this planet we've broken. The coolest thing about solar roadways is that it actually solves multiple problems at once by addressing the needs of an entire system, just the way nature solves its problems as an efficient system. You could say the same about our global market economy. Basically, it's an efficient way to meet our needs. But we found a pitfall with efficiency from this guy. Now, Wes Jackson's a very bright guy, geneticist, philosopher, farmer. So he really got our attention when he clued us into something called Jevons' paradox, which states that as an industrial society gets more efficient with its technology, it actually ends up using more resources. Consider a big box store chain that makes its fleet more efficient and then takes that savings to open up more box stores. So efficiency by itself doesn't help us get more sustainable unless we cap and reduce our extraction in conjunction with that increase in efficiency. But that undermines the fundamental premise of the growth economy and leads us to a pretty dramatic conclusion. Right, Wes? If I were elected president the first day at the inaugural, these would be my opening lines. My fellow Americans, we as a people are going to measure our progress by how independent of the extractive economy we become. We're not going to stop anything all at once, but we're going to set mileposts, and we are going to power down, and we're going to see to it that people are not hungry, we're going to see to it that they are sheltered and clothed. And this is the most important challenge for Homo sapien in our long evolutionary history. Now, powering down doesn't mean going back to the Stone Ages. It just means we stop solving our problems, but with deficit spending of fossil fuels, water, natural capital, and start solving them locally with creativity and systems thinking by consulting the 4.5 billion year old R&D lab known as Planet Earth. Nature solves its problems elegantly using current solar income and local renewable resources. And a little bit of humble observation goes a long way in helping us tap into that wisdom. Turns out that Janine Benyus um, coined a term for it called biomimicry. And uh, we had a good time digging into this one. We don't view the farm as a linear factory system, rather it's a whole set of cycles. And so what we want is the waste stream of one thing to be the beginning of the next enterprise. So the behind the cows becomes the incubator starter for the eggmobile. Herbivore manure contains the seven essential enzymes for proper avian digestion. See, they eat out the fly larvae and the pathogens and spread them out into the ground so that they sanitize the paddock behind the cow. Think of all of the labor we're getting here. Not only do we not pay them, but they pay us in eggs. If everybody did this in the United States, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Age in less than 10 years. Believe it or not, that's actually a conservative estimate. Trust us, we checked it. Joel Salatin's able to bring delicious, affordable, healthy local food to people by letting his animals do what they naturally want to do and by seeing waste as a resource. And the most dazzling example of waste as a resource we found on our road trip was the city museum. Best place to lose a kid. 
We're not your traditional museum. We're kind of based on found and recycled items. Our owner, Bob Castley, he goes to salvages where people donate things and he builds off what he is given. This is the coolest building I've ever seen in my whole life. Four tram cars from Bush Gardens, a full scale fire engine, two Cessna planes. The bus is on the roof. These are old tables that we turned into a tabletop pyramid. Rick, what was this thing? Kind of looks like a sewer tube or something like that. Awesome. Oh my goodness. It's like Land of the Lost. Even the concrete is recycled. Hook the truck up and just shoot it in. This is a cooling tank from Anheuser-Busch. Is there any beer left in here? No, I think we took that out. Time for the monster slot. When Bob bought this building, there was nothing in downtown. This is just a revitalization. The museum's been a huge part of that. Remember the museum saying, if you are here, you're not all there. <laughs> <laughs> so. Just imagine the possibilities knowing that every urban center has the raw material for its very own city museum, which is lots of garbage. We put ourselves through a challenge on the trip by keeping all of our garbage and recyclables with us in the car for the entire year-long trip, just so we could bring it to presentations. There you go, dude. <clears throat> Who knows, maybe one day, we'll be able to turn all of this into a completely self-sustaining home. The architecture of the future has to be accommodating all of the needs of people, not just shelter. If people can encounter the phenomena of the earth to get food, water, shelter, energy on their own, then the economy can go up and down and corporations can go bust or whatever, but people aren't gonna lose sustenance of life. It makes its own power harvests its own water, contains and treats its own sewage, produces food, heats and cools itself, and it's made from garbage. With this one facility, we have cleaned up 10,000 tires, 15,000 bottles and cans. Once that Earthship is complete, there is no carbon footprint. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And the Earthship is going to take care of you beyond people, beyond money, beyond corporations, beyond government. It is life support. We can use that kind of life support in buildings all across the country, and the LEED building certification is working to do just that. The godfather of LEED himself, Bob Berkebile, is taking things one step further. Of the 800 people we met on the Yurt road trip, we think he captures best the inspiration needed to navigate humanity's great environmental road trip. I think it's safe to say that the LEED rating system has exceeded our wildest expectations in terms of impact. Thank God. Not enough. Our goal is to create living buildings and living communities, which means you're having a restorative or a regenerative impact to move beyond the current environmental movement, which is about doing less harm. And we have to get over that and say, our responsibility is not to do less bad, but to do something creative and regenerative and restorative and loving. Thanks a lot. Thank you.